Peace and prosperity. Is that too much to ask for? In an interview earlier this year with Dr. Cornel West, amongst his very topics of discussion, Dr. West prophesied that just like in the Middle East, the U.S. might soon have its own spontaneous uprising. That conversation took place in April, and this uprising, he said, could happen in a completely unexpected way, catching the corporate plutocracy off guard. Dr. West came under fire when he referred to President Obama as the black mascot for Wall Street. This, however, Dr. West said, is exactly what they are afraid of, an uprising. Now it has come to pass, as what started off a month ago as a seemingly benign protest on Wall Street has spread across the nation in what we now call the Occupy Movement, involving sit-ins, sleep-ins, encampments, and vigils that echo around the world. In outrage at city leadership, a secondary movement has arisen to recall Oakland's current mayor, Gene Kwan. Solidarity has taken hold, and one of the Occupy vigils that has garnered much attention in recent days is in Oakland, California, involving a man named Scott Olson, an Iraq vet. Olson, who had been attending a protest in front of the Oakland City Hall building, was seriously injured by a police projectile when the Oakland City Police used aggressive force to drive protesters out of the encampment on the City Hall Plaza. The incident happened just a few days ago, and Olson has since been hospitalized with possible brain damage. I work with Iraq vets, says Maya Bruns, and when I heard about Olson, I felt I had to come down and show my support, Bruns says. Protesting and civil disobedience is not something she's ever been a part of, but in this case, she says she wanted her voice to be heard. Speaking to the Olson incident as well, on October 27th at The Nation magazine, John Nichols wrote, In cities across the United States and around the world, we are all Scott Olson vigils, rallies, and marches were held. Thousands attended a candlelight vigil in Oakland. In Las Vegas, an image of Olson was projected at the site of the Occupy encampment. In New York, Occupy Wall Street activists took to the streets chanting, New York is Oakland, Oakland is New York. As far away as London, images of Olson were displayed at gatherings. Others share the same sentiment, including Funi Su of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. It's a nonviolent organization supporting the Occupy movement in Oakland. And in a podcast interview, Su shared her thoughts about the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. She also talked about the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, the power of beauty, and the 1,000 Paper Cranes project that she and others are working on through the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, and sharing why she and the organization continue their presence on City Hall's Frank Ogawa Plaza, which some are now calling the Oscar Grant Plaza. This is Max Eternity, and I'm here at Occupy Oakland with Tuni Su. Uh, Tony is a nonviolent activist who is a graduate student um, studying uh, the process of nonviolence. Um, we're here in front of the uh, Frank Ogawa Plaza, which some now refer to as the Oscar Grant Plaza, and we're talking about the events of Occupy Oakland. Funi, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, first, could you talk a little bit about your studies, uh, your graduate school studies, and how that has led you to this interaction with nonviolent uh, protest? Of course. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate in the School of Education, and I used to teach elementary school in Los Angeles Unified. And part of my um, work is looking at issues of race, class, gender, and social justice in education. And in my investigation of those concerns, I realized that it's not just a matter of the leftist politics, uh, Marxism, um, class struggle, etc., but that we also need fundamentally a shift in how we think about humans and a shift in how we think about humanity. And so I started turning towards nonviolence as a way of thinking about that. And actually, that meant turning towards a very intimate practice and intimate familial background, which is Buddhism and thinking about what Buddhist philosophy has to offer. And at first I was a bit troubled because I only saw it as a religious or a social philosophy and I didn't see how I could integrate that with uh, my social activism and organizing. And then I became interested in reading more about different possibilities within Buddhism 
in relation to nonviolence and actually taking action. And I came across socially engaged Buddhism. And when I found this community of thinkers, um, practitioners, believers of socially engaged Buddhism and, and how they were enacting the principles of nonviolence and compassion for peace, I found it to be very um, involved and a very, I, I'm kind of hesitant to say militant practice because it's not militant in the traditional Perhaps stimulating way. and passionate? Um, very passionate. It's, it's aggressive with here. Absolutely. Right. I think that's important to understand because nonviolence is often thought of as being uh, passive, but there is absolutely an active aspect to uh, nonviolent resistance. Uh, could you talk about the uh, organization that you are participating uh, with in uh, here at Occupy Oakland? Of course. Um, I am here with the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, and the Buddhist Peace Fellowship is kind of a collective um, nationwide of people and organizations that are interested in doing that melding of Buddhism and social engagement. And yes. so there is a sense of urgency to be active in local politics, global politics. And it, um, really, I think it can be best to be summed up by Thich Nhat Hanh, um, who is a Zen Buddhist monk who wrote about this concept of interbeing. And um, I think the Buddhist Peace Fellowship really tries to take that engagement of interbeing, people interbeing with each other, but the interconnectedness with that interbeing um, as it relates to our social communities, the interconnectedness of global markets, and the ramifications of that and how it affects the interconnection with people and people's lives and how they're organized. And, and because of that, um, I think the Buddhist Peace Fellowship felt the urgency to have a presence here at Occupy Oakland. And I certainly felt like that was the way that my um, participation in social movements and uh, people movements wanted to turn more into turn more into something that wasn't just about leftist politics sure but something that was very spiritually um, driven and, and just really human driven right sure uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh because he is one of the um, spiritual leaders that is featured in an, uh, a monumental sculptural installation just a few blocks away from here uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, that includes Dr. Martin Luther King, Maya Angelou. It escapes me at the moment the name of it, but it is um, truly terrific. I think around, uh, it's near the Paramount Theater, actually. And uh, it's, it's an installation that will be happening in phases. Yes, absolutely. It's really nice to hear that because he also writes about this idea of conditions arising. And I think this is like a wonderful example of conditions arising. Um, the movement Occupy the overall Occupy movement, sure. Occupy Oakland, and the presence of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship and the installation of the pieces, Thich Nhat Hanh, Martin yeah. Etc. Absolutely. Um, I would like to ask about specifically about this um, 1,000 Cranes project, something that you uh, came up with uh, uh, that's uh, being carried out here on the plaza. Could you talk about that? Uh, yeah, I would love to. It's actually something that means a lot to me because there's so much beauty in it and so much community involvement in the project that it really brings me a lot of inspiration. And if I'm not mistaken, this comes from uh, Japanese culture? Right. So um, in Japan, traditionally, there is this idea that if you fold a thousand paper cranes, then your wish will come to fruition, whatever wish that is. And the story goes that um, after World War II in Japan, there was a young girl, Sadako Sasaki, who was diagnosed with leukemia because of um, the aftermath of the radiation bombing. Yes. yes, exactly. And what one of her friends did um, was to propose that they fold a thousand paper paints together um, as kind of a way to help her deal with her diagnosis. And Sadako and her friend got to, I think, maybe 663 or 664 cranes before she passed away. And when her friends heard, they came together and they created the rest of the cranes needed to make 1,000 for her. And the story got passed around through Japan and actually spread across the world. So her family and her friends were then receiving these paper cranes from all around the world. And it really was a way for people to show that they believed in this idea of global peace and harmony. And um, we wanted then to take up that idea here with the Buddhist Peace Fellowship and thinking about, well, what does it mean that we're here? Why are we here? And how can we bring our, our Buddhist politics to Occupy Oakland? 
And for me, I remember thinking about that question and, and referring back to something I read um, in terms of an example of a socially engaged Buddhist movement. And that example is called the Sarvadaya, um, Sarvadaya movement in Sri Lanka. And they have 10 principles for social organizing there. And part of the 10 are basic um, health care, food, shelter. But the one thing that really stuck out to me because I, I don't remember ever reading it anywhere else, that the basic human need for liberation is um, a clean and beautiful environment. Wow. And I thought that is, when I think about it, I just, I feel so much, like my heart resonates with that it's idea. It's profound. It's very profound. And I think oftentimes in social movements, we forget about how profound that kind of care and intention and beauty can be. Yes. So I propose that as an idea that, um, we can take this concept of making a beautiful, clean place, not that this isn't a beautiful and clean place already, but to bring it in through mindfulness by folding these cranes. Because folding cranes, it can be very frustrating, so it's yeah. actually a very meditative act I was thinking well. that it does have a meditative quality. <laughs> it certainly does. Yeah. You're like battling this need for perfection and all these different things. So things come up and you watch it with your mind, and, and it's such a appropriate thing to do for Occupy Oakland. With the anger that can come up, the different emotions, um, such as anger, which is very, very much understood, um, very valid, but to channel it in a way that's mindful. Right. Um, to take that that tendency to have these emotions that maybe we don't really understand and to examine them and be at peace with them. Um, and so I asked about the idea and um, people were interested in coming together around this concept of a thousand paper cranes and creating this project to solicit cranes from the community and people were interested in it. And so when you talk about anger being channeled and uh, what do you expect or what do you hope to happen here at Occupy Oakland? We've seen so much um, you know, anger and violence, uh, which resulted in um, uh, an Iraq war veteran um, being injured and is in the hospital right now with suspected brain damage. Um, he was injured by a police uh, projectile during the crackdown the other night. Um, what's the hope here for you? The hope here for me, and, and I think this is the beautiful thing about it, and the beautiful connection to the craze, is that I don't think it's just my hope. Um, from what has been demonstrated by the majority of the protesters and participants involved in Occupy Oakland, the hope is for non-violent, sustainable, structural change. And I think Systemic it's, change. It's systemic, yes. yes. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you, and I would just like to add that we are soliciting a thousand paper cranes. We've been trying to work with the Children's Village at Occupy Oakland before it got shut down. Um, there's word that they're recreating the Children's Village again, so we're trying to really get involved with the occupation itself and solicit cranes from children, adults, and anybody in the community. You don't have to be Buddhist, you don't have to meditate. We're just asking for cranes from people with the intention of peace and compassion and, and justice for people who have been oppressed. Is there a website address people can go to? Yes, they can go to www.bpf.org slash senbazuru, S-E-N-B-A-Z-U-R-E. And what's the main website? What's the name of the organization again? It's the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, and the website for that is www.bpf.org. So we actually started um, folding and hanging the cranes before the police came in on Tuesday and just uh, aggressively tore everything down and tried to erase any presence or trace of the care that was involved in creating such a community. So we had 50 cranes hanging from the tree um, where we, the Buddhist Peace Fellowship sat every day, or sits every day because we're continuing to do that through the occupation um, for a new meditation. And after the destruction of that day and the chaos and the violence of that night in which we had that Iraqi veteran who served in tours um, in Iraq get shot uh, with a rubber bullet, um, there was so much sadness and heartbreak in the community. I sure. remember that morning waking up to the sound of helicopters, and it didn't sound like Oakland. It sounded like we were in the middle. Like a of war zone. This it went on for like hours. Yes. yes. And it was it was heartbreaking and traumatizing for many people. But one of our Buddhist Peace Fellowship staff, she came out here that night, and she saw that our cranes were still hanging in the trees. So oh. despite it's the very touching. Yes. And just. Despite the attempt at um, 
disrupting. erasing. Yeah, it's disrupting and erasing. Sure. Community and compassion. It was the cranes were still there. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. And thanks again for taking the time with, to speak with me. MaxEternity.com, The Good Life.